From tent cities in urban downtowns to shelters and ad hoc efforts to house people during this year of COVID-19, staying home to stay safe simply hasn't been available to people in this province who are facing homelessness. With us now on what trying to move the yardsticks to help vulnerable people during a crisis has been like, four experts working to help house people. So let's welcome, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Rebecca Schiff, Associate Professor and Chair in the Department of Health Sciences at Lakehead University and the co-lead of the project At Home in the North. In Windsor, Ontario, Reverend Ron Dunn, Executive Director of the Downtown Mission of Windsor. In Kitchener, Ontario, Nadine Green, Site Coordinator of A Better Tent City. And in the downtown core of the provincial capital, Lorraine Lamb, an outreach worker at Sanctuary Toronto, who's got the best Twitter handle of anybody I've seen. Lorraine, what's your Twitter handle? Lorraine Lambchop. That is perfect. I love that. That is great. Uh, I want to thank all four of you for joining us tonight on TVO. I know you all just saw the interview that Peter Weltman, the FAO, did. And uh, why don't we just start there? Rebecca, have you got anything you want to react to from that interview? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I'll just point out two things. I think um, the, the first one that, that I... Uh, the, the first thing that caught me was that it's very focused on sort of, uh, I guess, financial aspects. And of course, this is coming from the financial accountability officer. So we're talking about affordability and very much in a monetary sense and how to lift people out of homelessness by providing more affordable housing. But I think one of the major issues that was missed is that there are a wide range of other supports that people need. And so just providing housing isn't always enough. It certainly is core to making sure that uh, that people can be safely and adequately housed but there are a lot of other needs as well and so i didn't really see any anything that uh that the accountability officer addressed um in, in that regard or that his report addressed the other thing that i draw attention to is just the methodologies for accounting for counting uh the number of homeless people and so he had mentioned that the province had just mandated that all of the uh, municipalities and regions in the province can't now count uh, homeless people using a new methodology. It's not really a new methodology that they're mandating and, and it's a somewhat flawed methodology. So I think that there uh, needs to be a bit more thought into um, the way that we count um, who's homeless and, and where people homeless, uh, homeless people are living. Okay, we get those comments on the record. Nadine Green, what would you add to that? Um, I, <clears throat> can, I, can I just wanted to add about the numbers and how we the government needs to get help from outside people or people from this panel. And it was, it was just enlightening hearing everything that he said. Okay, I think we're about to do that over the next half hour. Uh, Reverend Dunn, what would you say? You know, the takeaways for me were, um, were anger, to be honest, from the report. Um, it was very well done. Uh, my anger is not pointing at anybody. But the system itself, the headline on the, on the uh, document was, falling short on housing and homelessness. Um, after 10 years, we're going to be no further ahead than we are today. Um, and that's the plan. I don't think as Canadians, you know, living in the greatest country in the world, that we should accept a plan that's anything less than a move forward. Um, and that that's my kind of my opening comments for, for that report. Okay. Lorraine, anything to add from downtown Toronto? I would say that, um, I mean, even the report emphasizes that it's not enough. I know in Toronto, we're seeing 600 new people enter the shelter system. So this status quo is clearly not working. And I think it's important to name that even the report says that they don't take COVID into account. And we know that so many people have lost jobs over this pandemic season. And so the numbers of people who actually need better supports are going to rise. And the plan right now is hardly a plan. All right. We should just remind everybody for what it's worth that, that Peter Weltman, the financial accountability officer, did this report in response to a request from a member of the Ontario legislature who asked that he look into the issue. Um, so, again, we just put that on the record as a means of understanding how this thing came to be in the first place. Let's, speaking of understanding, understand better what it is that you folks do. Nadine, why don't you start us off? A better tent city in Kitchener. What's your mission? So I'm the site um, the site coordinator of a better tent city, tiny, tiny homes. I take care of the day to day up, the day to day oper operation. Sorry. And how many people here, do you serve? We have fifty people here at the moment. Fifty people that that is working with your organization or that you are serving. 
50, 50 people that I'm serving, people that, that are homeless and hard, that were hard to house. And they're all living here, living well. And um, I make sure everything go okay. Um, I make sure everything is okay. I I break up fights. I give orders for jobs. Like people do their own jobs here, doing the cleaning, taking care of stuff like that. Understood. Ron Dunn, tell us about your organization. Sure. We are the United Church of Canada Downtown Mission. Um, so we've been here since 1972. All of our programs and services, there's about a dozen from youth services. We run the, the largest uh, shelter in our area, 103 beds, um, food recovery, food services, job reintegration, anything that has to do with helping people lift themselves out of poverty. And, uh, and certainly emergency shelter is, is a big part of what we do every day. 103 beds. How often are they full? Sadly, too often. Um, COVID has changed some things, of course. But the other number, you know, we do about 910 meals a day, uh, hot meals for people in our community. So uh, we rescue 1.5 million pounds of produce a year and redistribute it from the county into the city. It's a, it's a as an unfunded agency, it's quite a quite a challenge, but um, one that we we do f from a faith faith based lens. Lorraine, Sanctuary Toronto does what? We are a community downtown Toronto. Um, that exists to really be um, a space where people who are on the margins of our society are most valued and centered. Um, and we often want to highlight that people who are on the margins are there because of larger systems that intersect to keep people in that space. And I think it's important to name, you know, earlier, Steve, you said that it's important to have experts around the room to talk about this. And I need to say that the experts on the housing reality and the homelessness crisis are the people who are on the streets right now who are not sitting in front of the Zoom camera right now speaking to you. I hear you. And how many people do you serve? Uh, I would say that during COVID, we've definitely seen an increase of people coming to access food and support. So I would say every meal we're serving, we have about 300 to 400 meals that we're serving every day. Hmm. And with a staff of how many people? We are a small little crew of about 18 people. Small but mighty. Yeah, we try. <laughs> I betcha. Rebecca Schiff, tell us about At Home in the North. At Home in the North. So when the National Housing Strategy was launched uh, a few years ago, uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, or CMHC, partnered with one of the federal uh, research funding agencies called SHRC, or the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, to fund uh, large partnerships that bring together researchers, organizations, people with lived experience of homelessness and, and, and housing issues to work on the priorities of the National Housing Strategy. So there are several priorities in the National Housing Strategy, and there are a few different of these partnership grants or partnership research projects that were funded. And At Home in the North is one of them, and it addresses Northern housing and homelessness as a priority under the Northern Housing Strategy. So I co-lead that um, with colleagues at Memorial University, uh, McGill University, and Ryerson. Uh, and we're, we're interested in learning about solutions and how to end homelessness in, in Northern Canada. With that background now in place, oh, you know what, just before I do that, it's interesting that you said in Northern Canada, because my hunch is there is an impression out there that people think homelessness is a big city urban problem and maybe not much of a problem anywhere else. Would you care, Rebecca, to dispel that notion? Yes, I, I would very much so. Uh, homelessness is a huge issue in, in northern communities, in rural communities. I work a lot with the National Alliance to End Rural and Remote Homelessness as well, which is part of the larger Canadian Alliance to End homelessness. And what we're finding through some of our recent research is that in many rural areas in small cities like Thunder Bay, the rates of homelessness are actually double what they are or double or more what they are in big cities. So for example, in Thunder Bay, the homelessness rate, uh, uh, the percentage of people are, who are homeless is double what it is in Toronto or Calgary and quadruple what it is in Vancouver. So homelessness is very much an issue in rural and Northern Canada. And how many clients would you be dealing with, with at home in the North? We're, we're not dealing specifically with clients, so we work with the organizations that work with uh, people who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity, and so I would estimate that that represents thousands, tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands in the North? Yes. Okay, well, that leads us to our next line of questioning, which is everybody in this country knows that homelessness has been an intractable, intractable problem for decades and decades. And now we've just had COVID-19 dumped on top of it to boot. 
So Lorraine, start us off if you would. What has COVID-19 done to the homelessness issue that you were already dealing with? I think COVID has actually shone a light on the shadows where our governments and policies have tried to hit homeless people. Um, it's been clear during the pandemic that um, resources were hardly sufficient before the pandemic. And now this pandemic has really shown that these gaps have just been exacerbated. I think COVID comes at a time when the homelessness reality was in a state of emergency, as is the poison drug reality. So now we're living in this reality of like the triple threat of pandemics and people are literally dying just trying to, to get housing somewhere. Nadine, do you notice that there is more homelessness and harder to serve homeless people because of this pandemic? Yes, there is. And because of the pandemic, I guess there's more help for the people. They put them up in hotels and everything like that. And you, do you, I guess you appreciate the fact that the governments have been prepared to do something on that. Yes, I am, very much. But I presume there's going to be a time when putting up homeless people in hotels is no longer going to be an option. What then? That's why they need to come up with more tiny homes, community, like what Ron Dell did, and that will help. Tell me what you mean when you say tiny homes. I heard you say that before, and I should have followed up then, but I'm going to follow up now. Well, at the at where I am at the lot 42, a better 10 city, it's a tiny home community with tiny homes. We have 20, 26 homes here at the moment. And what's a tiny home? It's an eight by 10. It's kind of like a shed, but it's a tiny home. And that's, that is what we're doing here to house the home homeless people. How many square feet would it be? Uh, it's about eight by 10. <laughs> so you're not kidding. It's tiny. And I live in one of them. Does it get the job done though? Yes, it does. It keeps you warm. It's just a safe place for you to be in and you have your own key and it's like it's home. Okay. Uh, Reverend Dunn, how about you? Talk to us about whether or not COVID has made homelessness in Southwestern Ontario look and feel different? Well, I'll, I'll echo, echo the statements made uh, out of Toronto. Um, what's happened is that I think all levels of government have, they knew about homelessness, but now it's it's much more prevalent. There's a light been, been shone on it, or the, the veil's been lifted, as it were. At one point um, during the first um, shutdown here in, in Windsor, Essex, we were the only kind of game in town in terms of, you know, it was like a little bit of a, I was expecting tumbleweeds to go through past my window here. Um, People experiencing homelessness really had nowhere to go outside of of uh, a couple of, of shelters here locally. So um, I, I think and I hope that we've learned some things from this, that it doesn't go away when when we deem that the pandemic has been uh, tackled. And, and I hope that we'll be able to say that someday. Um, things like tiny homes, for example, in Kitchener-Waterloo, I think everyone's been looking at that project. Um, it takes political will. It takes um, government to say, okay, we know about zoning bylaws, but we're gonna we're gonna help push these things through um, because they're necessary. We have been trying to build a new facility for the last couple of years. It's very difficult, and um, I think that this pandemic has has opened up the eyes of people who say, look, there's a lot more homelessness either hidden or or visual than we first anticipated. Now, were you not ordered to shut down by the provincial state of emergency? I was. Um, so we we became an outbreak, um, 23 or 24 of my staff and uh, about 60 or 70 guests were affected with uh, with COVID-19. So we were ordered to shut down. We voluntarily left our buildings and went to a, um, a larger facility where we felt we could control social distancing a little better. Um, and so, yeah, we, we've had our, our series of challenges with uh, with local government, quite frankly, and, uh, and just trying to, to navigate the pandemic um, in a world, you know, we certainly weren't prepared for it. Now, when you were ordered to shut down, did you at any point disobey the law and reopen anyway? Well, uh, I'm sure if my lawyer was sitting to me, he'd say <laughs> for me to say no. But you know, the truth is this: um, we did reopen um, what was deemed as a rogue shelter. The system that we created, we helped create, was we moved everybody to a, a city uh, facility. Um, it left a gap. In service and the mission's role has always been to fill gaps so i'm always going to respond by saying that whatever's in the best interest of those i serve i will do and so for a period of about a week i did operate uh, what would, would have been considered an illegal shelter um, 
but there was 36 people, 35 people that needed a place to go. Um, some of them, when when the closure happened to us, had nowhere to go. Um, they weren't being accepted in in a timely fashion. So I pushed for, you know, emergency shelter in real time, and and we got that. You know, it was really just a communication gap. I, I hope um, nobody obviously would do anything malice to to our our population. So it really was just kind of figuring out those gaps and and closing them up. And so yeah, I, I ran against the law for a little bit. I get you. You you are a rogue after all, but. Um... And, and, and you plead guilty to that. I can see that. You don't mind being called that. Yeah. I wear it with pride, actually. There you go. But I guess I wonder, you know, it's, you're running a congregate setting. So did anybody catch COVID as a result of those actions? Yeah, well, I don't know if they caught COVID, but there were certainly more cases identified. My argument is that if we had not done that, those folks would have been on the street in contact with even more people. So um, eight more people came out of our, our temporary shelter, or the rogue shelter, if you will, um, with having been found positive. But I would argue that they probably were positive going in. Um, at the end of the day, and I, I don't know if our other panelists will, will agree, COVID is one element of what might affect or does affect those living uh, rough or, or experiencing homelessness. Um, have to deal with. And and so in some ways, it was not the most important aspect of of their day, if that makes sense. I saw people nodding their heads while you were saying that. So yes, I hear you. Uh, Rebecca, I want to go to you next because you, I guess when we had the H1N1 issue some years back, you studied homelessness at that time. What were the lessons that you might have learned on that occasion that could be applied to where we're at today? So one of the things we learned, Steve, was first of all, that most cities uh, in Canada did not have pandemic preparedness plans that included homeless people as a vulnerable population. And we also know that homeless people um, and people who are sleeping rough and are housing insecure are incredibly vulnerable to infectious disease. And and there, there are just a, a range of, of concerns that, that arise when, when there's infectious disease or, or a pandemic like we're experiencing now. So we what we identified from that research was one that homeless people needed to be considered part of the vulnerable populations that should be addressed first and should have special consideration during pandemic events and also that there needed to be more support for municipalities and regions to create pandemic plans that could respond to the needs of the homeless sector and so we saw some of that research taken up by the federal government so in health canada's um pandemic uh, preparedness uh, in influenza guide or pan pandemic preparedness for the health sector uh, guide, they had identified uh, following our H1N1 research, they identified that homeless people should be considered as part of vulnerable populations during pandemics. But we did not see the creation of pandemic plans in, in many cities, in many places. Thunder Bay is one of those places where there was no pandemic plan that included uh, homeless people as, as part of the special or vulnerable populations that needed, um, that needed unique considerations. And so, uh, so during this pandemic, you know, we've seen a, a lot of challenges in terms of making sure that we can um, keep homeless people safe and not just homeless people, the staff who work with homeless people as well, who are at much higher risk of um, uh, contracting the virus. I know we were kibitzing a moment ago with Ron about whether his was a rogue shelter, but I guess I should put this on the record here because we did receive this statement from the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. So, Sheldon, if we would, let's put this graphic up here and we'll read along. Since the declaration of the outbreak at the downtown mission of Windsor, the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit has worked closely with the mission leadership, health system partners, and the city of Windsor to stop the spread of COVID-19 and provide support for those seeking shelter. We work together and continue to work together to resolve the COVID-19 outbreak and allow a safe reopening of the downtown mission. Ron, I guess I should give you a chance to comment on that. Is that how does that sound to you? Yeah, it's, it's spot on. Um, you know, after we got through the whether I was rogue or not conversation, um, we really pulled together. My team went, actually, my staff went to run or, or co-run the city facility, uh, what, you know, we're calling it the aquatic center. Um, it, it did, we did pull together. And actually today we received the all clear from the health unit to reopen. So we're um, expecting our, our first uh, guest to arrive back around one o'clock today. So we're really excited about that. Good. Lorraine, um, here's the sort of tricky balancing act question that I've got to ask, which is how do you balance the need to shelter people who are experiencing homelessness, particularly at during the wintertime and was a, a tough winter for a lot of people, 
while at the same time trying to protect them from outbreaks that they have probably a better chance of experiencing in a congregate care setting. How do you deal with all that? Yeah, it's definitely a tough balance. I thought that it was really interesting that um, there was this pandemic plan that was not in place. So I think how the Toronto government has been responding has been incredibly reactive. We had been talking to city officials in the spring, asking them, like, what is the plan for winter when there's going to be more people who need to come inside. We were seeing people in the community have to make a choice between staying in congregate settings or being outside where they know they could be safely isolated, um, but there was no access to even things like bathrooms, which we actually still don't have. And right now we're actually seeing COVID outbreaks in a whole bunch of hotel shelters across the city. And the recovery hotel is actually nearing capacity. So people actually have no alternative spaces to go to isolate, even when they get COVID. So now people with COVID in the shelter system are just remaining in these settings, which is a recipe for a disaster. Um, we know that homeless people are five times more likely to die from the virus and 20 more times 20 times more likely to have to access intensive care support. So there hasn't actually been any plan in place as spoken about earlier. And so I think what we're seeing is then a lot of people saying, no, like being inside these um, hotel shelter spaces are actually not safe for me. And so this is why we see a lot more people um, camping outside in public spaces. Because they think they can be safer under those circumstances from the virus. Is that it? Absolutely. I mean, government officials tell us, I mean, stay home to stay safe, but if you have no home, you can't do that. And then they tell you to socially distance and isolate where we know that's not possible in, in congregate hotel shelters, shelter settings. And so being outside is really like the, the safest option to abide by actual um, health and safety protocol. Hmm. Have you got a guess, Lorraine, at what percentage of the people that you deal with might have received a vaccination so far? Um, I think specifically in our community, I would say it's quite low because specifically in our community, um, not a lot of people are actually staying in the shelter system. So the shelter system is currently prioritized for vaccinations. And we know that there are, there are some people who are quite excited about it and other people who are needing more information before deciding to. Um, but there's a lot of people in the community I work with who ride transit overnight, who stay at subway stations, who are wandering out and about in the streets, and those communities are actually not being prioritized for the vaccine, and there's no plan in terms of what vaccination rollouts might look like at a drop-in center, for instance. And so I would say a large number of our community right now are not vaccinated. Hmm. Nadine, how about you? Uh, could you give us a sense about what percentage of the population you deal with has been vaccinated? He, um, here at the lot, like, we have the vaccine rollout. Like, we have about 20 20 people so far that got vaccinated here. 20 out of Benetton City. 20 out of how 20 many? 20 out of 50. 20 out of 50. Okay, well, that's actually a better, that's a much higher percentage than the, than the province in general. I think, you know, it's mm -hmm. probably about 12 or 13% of the province that's been vaccinated so far. So you're doing better than most of the rest of the province. But do I, I mean, I, I'm guessing that you'd like to have everybody vaccinated as soon as possible, because after all, they are, more inclined to get COVID-19 than the average member of the population. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And they're coming back today again to do another vaccination rollout, so. They are, how I many How many will you get done today? Maybe another 20. Another 20, so, okay. Yeah. Ron Dunn, how about with the folks you deal with? What percentage has been vaccinated? Yeah, so across the shelter system here, I believe that uh, they reported about 150, 160 vaccinations were done in the last week, week and a half. So um, given our population, um, we, we're really pleased with that number. I, I think that um, many that are in our population um, have trust issues. And, and so um, making that personal decision to get a vaccine was not easy for, for many, myself included, to be honest. Um, you know, you got to weigh all those things. So you know, I'm I'm really thrilled with the with the rollout plan. Our our health unit and our in the city of Windsor officials and those that were involved in it um, did a great job. Rebecca, the organizations that you and your organization deal with, what percentage of the folks do you think have been vaccinated? I couldn't say it across all of northern Canada, but I could speak for Thunder Bay. Um, and in Thunder Bay, there has been quite a turnaround. I, I spoke before about how there were, wasn't a pandemic plan in place for uh, the homeless sector, but 
uh, that's really changed since the beginning of COVID-19. And so homeless, uh, the homeless population has been prioritized. So people experiencing homelessness or housing instability are prioritized to receive vaccinations. And so there are a lot of people that are getting vaccinated right now. Something else I should mention that seems a, a little bit of the el elephant in the room for me is that Indigenous people are vastly overrepresented in the homeless population in, in Canada and especially in, in Thunder Bay and other northern locations. And so Indigenous uh, Indigenous adults were also prioritized for COVID vaccinations, which has um, certainly uh, made an impact in the city as well. There is an understandable, given the colonial history between uh, settler culture and Indigenous people in this country, there is an understandable... Um, well, what word do we want to use here? Fear, concern, lack of trust. Um, you know, when, when official medicine shows up to say, here, I've got a vaccine of something, take this. Have you noticed, uh, Rebecca, any vaccine hesitancy among Indigenous people? I think there's some vaccine hesitancy among people who are experiencing homelessness. But I can't say that it's necessarily because um, someone is indigenous and has a mistrust of the government, or it, or it could be for for other reasons. I I just don't know. But I, that it certainly could could be a factor, and there's a lot of cause for mistrust of of the government um, that that's understandable among indigenous people in Canada. Lorraine, how about you? Are you seeing any vaccine hesitancy? I would echo Rebecca actually that the hesitancy isn't simply just within the Indigenous community, but it's across the homelessness sector. Specifically in Toronto, though, Anishinaabe Health Toronto has been prioritizing vaccines for the Indigenous community. And um, a lot of people sort of see their peers and their elders in the community who are getting the vaccine. So there is some level of trust building there. I would say that colonialism, we are seeing that play out presently in the city's approach to encampments. Um, and how we have city staff coming in to basically displace a whole bunch of people uh, camping on the lands and forcing them elsewhere. And we're seeing people die when, they force, when they're forced to leave the encampments. What, what are the alternatives, though? I think at this point, we know that the hotel shelter options are not safe for people. And so actually, I think what we really need is a long-term plan for housing. Um, a lot of these hotel shelters in Toronto are only leased until 2021, like the end of the year. And as of right now, there's no plan for what happens after. So where where are all these people in the hotel, hotel shelter supposed to go? Um, and furthermore, like a lot of people who are outside are simply just waiting for housing. The housing list right now for subsidized housing it's about 10 years for a bachelor apartment and 12 years for a one bedroom apartment. And so people are literally just waiting for an opportunity because there are so many people on the housing list. So I think that actually the solution to encampments and these hotel shelters and, and all of this stuff is actually prioritizing the building of affordable housing um, and making housing actually affordable for the larger population. Well, we've got a clip that speaks to this. So let's play that now because uh, the deputy mayor, one of the deputy mayors for Toronto is Michael Thompson. And we had him on this program about a month ago, brought up the issue of these encampments in general, and one carpenter in particular who was building little homes for people experiencing homelessness. Let's have a look at that. Sheldon, if you would. We want to actually remove people from the street and the encampment and put them in places where they're safe and they're well housed and they're warm. That is our effort with respect to trying to deal with this particular problem. We're investing a tremendous amount of resources. We're putting a lot of staff time. And we're actually being quite successful in terms of removing. We've removed a significant number of people from the encampment. And I think it's important for us to ensure that we provide a safe environment for all those who are in need. So when we see a situation in which it is unsafe, we cannot endorse and we cannot support. Lorraine, how does that sound to you? I have to strongly disagree with that statement. Um, moving people into hotel shelters is not actually safe. Um, the city talks a lot about fire safety. And actually, I know personally somebody who died in a hotel fire um, just over New Year's Day. There was another fire shortly after that in a different hotel. And somebody I know who is uh, requiring a wheelchair was not able to leave her room while the fire was happening. And so she was trapped inside the space. So I would say that safety as the reason to clear encampments is not an adequate reason at all. Um, it's oh, again, like we're in the middle of a pandemic and the outbreaks in hotel shelters have been awful. So moving people into these outbreak spaces is actually not the safest option. I would say that also, a lot of people who have moved into these shelter hotel spaces 
have left because of a bunch of various reasons. So clearing encampments is actually just displacing people to other parks, and it actually directly contradicts what CDC says is safe health and safety protocols. The CDC clearly says that dismantling encampments is not appropriate during the pandemic, and yet the city is moving forward on it anyway. Hmm. Rebecca, can I ask you about the kinds of encampments that people are accustomed to seeing in the bigger cities? Are you seeing those in the north? We don't see, I would say, the large encampments that you see in, in Thunder Bay or, or Vancouver or some of the other places, the, the tent cities that um, that we know exist in those large cities. People do often um, set up camps and probably smaller camps. So you might have a group of 10 people or maybe just one person who, who sets up camp. But they're much less visible, I think, than they are in, in the big cities because smaller cities, the places in the north like Thunder Bay, they're so close to rural areas that people, if they, if they want to camp, if if they want to be away from the shelters and and the city and have their own space, it's it's much easier to escape into into the wild and and set up camp there. Gotcha. We've got just a few minutes left here, and I'd love to get just some ideas from all of you as to uh, what might be done to improve the situation. Nadine, if you had the ear of the Premier of Ontario right now, what would you tell him you need? I would tell him that uh, that we need more tiny homes. <laughs> <laughs> I everywhere keep in tiny homes everywhere for um homeless people instead of putting them in hotels i think tiny homes is the way to go how much do they cost each i think they cost about five thousand dollars to to build for everything all the work so you can get them up quick and dirty and they do the job yeah that's right <laughs> okay there's a pitch for uh tiny homes for more tiny homes across ontario ron dunn what if you had the premier's ear what would you tell him well, I'd, I'd invite them, as I have done multiple times, down for a tour of Windsor, Essex. I, I think, you know, if you're going to make decisions about um, geo geographical regions, you, you need to have seen it firsthand. Um, but, you know, affordable housing. How do, you end ho how do you end homelessness? You provide housing that is affordable and sustainable. Our community has not had a um, sustainable or an investment in affordable housing in almost 35 years. Until recently, their, their shovel is in the ground. But it's... Um, Maybe too little, too late. Based on based on everything that we know, in 2018 we had 168 families experiencing chronic homelessness. In 2019 we had 342. We're going in the wrong direction. We need strong government mandate to our municipalities from all levels of government to get involved, and that's going to require funding. And I hate to make everything about funding always, but you you can't build a tent city or you can't do any of those things with um, without money. And I'll just say I'm not. I've never advocated for tents. This is Canada. A basic living, you know, human right is a home. So I think while a tent is a, you know, maybe a short-term alternative, definitely not something that we endorse here at the Downtown Mission. Rebecca, advice for the Ontario government? Steve, I'll, I'll pick up a bit on the financial accountability officer's report because I, I do agree with um, what he was saying about the fact that we need more support. There isn't enough being done right now. And so um, certainly we need more funding for affordable housing, but we really need more support for rural and remote communities and also for the small cities that serve large rural areas. So cities like Thunder Bay, Sudbury, uh, Kenora, Sioux Lookout that serve uh, quite large homeless populations and, and need more support uh, for the services that they can provide. Lorraine, I know we just had a budget in the province of Ontario, so we know what's in that. We don't know yet what's in the federal budget, which is coming out the third week of April. You want to offer some advice to the feds? Um, I would echo that tents are last resorts and people really need housing. Um, and so right now, people who are trying to get out of the tents um, are not able to get housing. So we need, actually need affordable housing. I would say that the country has determined that an appropriate level to survive on every month is $2,000 on CERB. But meanwhile, social assistance rates are much below that. Um, Ontario Welfare, you get $350 for basic needs and a top up of $397 for rent supplement. That totals your check to just $700. How is it that we keep people who are on social assistance on that kind of income when the country has determined that people actually need at least $2,000 to live. Um, I think that is a big gap in terms of how policy is failing. And I think the tents and encampments are a visible symptom of all the failures that, are, that we're seeing. And a quick follow-up, Lorraine. Do you think the decision makers understand that all of these issues that we've been talking about, not just homelessness per se, but all of the issues that spring from that, do, do they understand the interconnectedness of all those issues? 
don't think they do. I would agree that um, they need to actually come and see it in person. Not one counselor really has shown up to one of the encampments to take a look around to see what's happening, maybe once or twice. You know, I think during this pandemic, we've heard politicians say, we are all in this together. But I think what's actually unsaid is, we are all in this together unless you're poor, unless you're poor, then good luck. Well, we hope some of them are listening. And we're grateful to all of you for joining us on TVO tonight to help us better understand this issue. Rebecca Schiff in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Reverend Ron Dunn in Windsor, Ontario. Nadine Green in Kitchener, Ontario. And Lorraine Lamb in the downtown of the provincial capital. Good wishes to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.